Hey guys, um, Mark Boswell here, Boswell Emergency Medical Education. Um, I'm putting this up on uh, YouTube and Facebook for you guys that are following on my Facebook page. And I wanted to give you just a little more of an explanation to the question that we had put up the other day about the uh, patient having the uh, mild uh, allergic reaction. Um, there's a lot of discussion about it, and I want to make sure that we, um, we're all on the same page on that. You know, the purpose of putting these questions up is to help you guys specifically, not so much just generally, um, general teaching purposes, but mostly specifically to prep people for board exams and their certification exams, which are written in a certain way, in a style, and I try and replicate that when I write those questions for you. So the question I'm referring to, I believe it was number 174. If you scroll back through the Facebook page, you'll see it and you could uh, read it again, but it was basically describing a patient who, if I recall correctly, had <clears throat> a fairly uh, on, a sudden onset um, after eating, so we, we can assume it may have been a food allergy of some kind, but they were having some facial and labial swelling, so some facial swelling and some swelling of the lips. The question did not specifically say how much swelling, and that was intentional. It just says there was some there, and that's when your first uh, exam teaching points I want you to understand is that you never read more into the question than is on the statement. So by reading that question that there is oral and facial swelling or labial swelling, we don't assume that their face is swollen up the size of a basketball. We don't assume that their lips are swollen the size of someone with, with some massive angioedema. We just assume there is some present. That's The amount is not the key. The question then also said the patient was having dyspnea. Dyspnea is a very subjective term. Uh, it does mean shortness of breath. Dyspnea does not imply and it should not, and do not read more into this, does not imply airway obstruction. It just says that they're short of breath to some extent. The question doesn't go any further to give you a respiratory rate, O2 saturations, uh, etc. The question nowhere says they're having strider, crowing, or wheezing. It doesn't mention labored breathing. Okay, again, the teaching point here is dyspnea is dyspnea. It's shortness of breath is subjective. The actual teaching point that the question is asking is the last statement. What is the priority intervention? Whenever you see the word priority in a testing in a professional exam scenario, you need to always default back to your original assessment series, your primary assessment of the ABCs, and then your secondary assessment, the head to toe exam, and then your other adjuncts, i.e. your vital signs, um, your other treatments, etc. So when we see priority, or when you see the word first, or the most um, important, uh, let's not go with the important, let's say priority or first, it always means you default back to your ABCs and do them in that order. So in this patient, it said, what is the priority intervention? We have to start with A from our primary assessment. A for airway. Is there any evidence given of an immediate airway life-threatening problem? In this question, no, there's not. If the test question author, in this case myself, was wanting you to identify that, I would have told you there's strider, there's wheezing, there's cyanotic, they're having labored breathing, there's depressed mental state. Something of those things indicates an impending immediate life-threatening airway. There's nothing that says that in this question. Okay, so we have no immediate airway threat in this patient. So we go to the next step, B. Do we have a breathing problem? Well, we have the dyspnea. It's not specific and it doesn't tell you how much or how labored it is, but there is dyspnea there. All right, when you have a breathing problem in the primary assessment, what is your intervention for a breathing problem? First, universally, is to apply oxygen. Anybody that's having any breathing issues, and until you know otherwise, as confirmed after your primary and secondary assessment, and you put all your data together, you get administer them oxygen, because the worst crime is to deny them the oxygen. Okay, granted, you're wanting to reach right for that epi and reverse the effects. However, at this moment, the priority, the first thing under step B, is to address the breathing. They have some symptoms of depressed breathing or suppressed breathing. Give them 100% oxygen. Okay. So I'm trying to recall the answer to the question there. All right. Um, so our next step would be C, circulation. Under circulation, you check a pulse. You look at the skin, uh, the skin temperature. Look for moisture, diaphoresis. It might indicate they're in shock. You might check capillary refill at that point. There's no information in the test question about anything to do with circulation. So we can assume that there's no circulation life threats going on. Oops, sorry about that. Let's get your um, camera light back on there. I'm going to use a flash here because it's nighttime. All right. Um, so the 
the first priority intervention following the, the primary and secondary assessment paradigm we would run into of those answers is to apply 100% oxygen. Why is epi not the right answer to this test question? Epi is not the right answer because we don't give drugs at any point during the primary assessment. Okay, and we and the applying oxygen trumps the others. So we don't give, matter of fact, you wouldn't want, even want to give the epi yet until you check a heart rate at least. What if their heart rate was 250? Would you still give epi? I don't know. That's a clinical decision you can't make. The question does not give you that information, but that is good practice to know that. Okay. Um, we want to at least do a primary assessment before we give drugs. The second reason epi is not the correct answer, it is not a valid, as it's written, it is not a valid drug order. It only says epi 0.3 milligrams. It does not give you a route. All right. So in other words, how do you know that's the right answer? Is it 0.3 milligrams nebulized? Is it 0.3 milligrams sub-Q? You know those are not correct for what you're thinking might be anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis would be intramuscular, intravenous, or intraosseous. Okay? So that's another reason why the epi is not the right question. Yeah, this blows your mind, and you're like, you know, in clinical practice day-to-day, -day, I would see my patient, I would know what's going on, and I would administer the epi right away. Granted, but remember, this is geared towards test preparation. This is how the test will be written, whether it be a uh, national registry exam, it be an emergency nursing certification exam, be a CCR, some other type of professional, validated, national, peer-reviewed exam. Not something your nursing instructor or EMT instructor made up on the weekend, a professional exam, that's how it's written. Priority means go through the ABCs and do the first thing that comes up under one of those, if it's appropriate. All right, so epi is not the right answer to this question. Not that you would not do it clinically on the street or at the bedside, I understand that. But remember what the teaching point is here, okay? So this is not a bad question. And a lot of times people get frustrated with this. They say, it was a bad question, it shouldn't be on the test. Not true. The purpose and the focus of how these questions are written serves a purpose and a focus, which is to test a certain thing. In this case, it's testing, are you familiar with your primary and secondary assessments and what happens during them? It's not asking what is the best treatment. That's another key word you can look for. When a question says what is the best or the most specific or the most useful, that type question is asking for a specific remedy. Then you could consider the epi, but I would tell you that epi is still not a right answer because it's not a valid drug order, and that's how it would be on a professional exam. You try and do this scenario in a national registry clinical scenario with your patient assessment, you would get a critical automatic fail. You would not give epi during a primary assessment, let alone had you not even checked the circulation or the disability or finish at least your primary assessment first. So I hope that answers that. And again, remember the purpose and the focus of how I write these questions is trying to replicate a board exam certification scenario, which is written in a certain way, which may not be what you're used to in the street, at the bedside, etc. But frame it like that, that's how it's going to help you be successful on the test, okay? And I'm giving you this from the experience of taking the exam myself uh, six times, taking National Registry twice, as well as taking courses in testing methodology, design, and evaluation. So I'm not just making this stuff up. I'm actually giving you the experience I've gained to share with you to help you learn. So I'm going to close. I hope that helps to understand that. Feel free to question, uh, send me questions, comments, feedback, or whatever. I'll be glad to engage with the, and reply to those.